Hello everyone and welcome back to Space Basics. In this video I'm going to discuss landing on the moon. This will be applicable to other bodies of similar size that do not have an atmosphere, but most of the time that will be the moon. And we are going to take a look at a few strategies in here, uh, discussing their relative merits and deficiencies. And then I'm going to do a demonstration with the lunar module from the Apollo program and show you how that's done, as that's probably the most common thing, especially for crewed missions, how that goes. Uh, but it is sort of touchy because it is a very long burn and if you have, you have to manage it properly to make sure that you land without having to reignite the engine. There is only one ignition on the lunar module that is meant for descent. You have to keep it on the entire way and throttle properly. So we'll talk about how that works. But let's talk about probes first because they're a totally different setup, generally speaking. And there are a number of strategies you can use. These days, a lot of the space probes use a strategy similar to the Apollo uh, lander instead of the way the probes in the 1960s worked. The probes in the 1960s basically aimed directly for the moon as an impactor and then slowed down at the last minute instead of trying to get into orbit first because the getting into orbit around the moon introduces a whole lot of perturbations because the moon is sort of lumpy and your orbit sort of wobbles around the moon so sometimes the location that you gotta land at is un not pr easily predictable if you get into orbit first uh, so they just tried to aim directly at the moon at the spot that they wanted to land at and then slow down right at the last minute this saves you from accidentally smacking into a hillside for instance that happens uh, but the downside is that's not very very efficient particularly speaking uh, in order to make it as efficient as possible, you need to slow down quickly. Just You can see that most of this surveyor probe's impulse is delivered in 40 seconds, as opposed to a normal lunar lander, which can take like 8 minutes to slow down. It'll slow down very quickly. Its maximum thrust to weight ratio is 8. That's hardly a reasonable for crew, and it will experience these high thrust to weight ratios. And then, but at least uh, for the final portion, it switches to these tiny engines here, these surveyor engines. So what it looks like is, actually, uh, we are lacking the landing legs here. They're rather large landing legs, too. Uh, so these go like that. The SRB here, it is a solid booster for reliability's sake. And, of course, solid boosters deliver their thrust very quickly. So it's a 40-second solid booster that goes off. And then these tiny little surveyor engines do throttle, and they do the last bit. They have 2 minutes and 44 seconds. And you see the 0.37 thrust weight ratio here. But, of course, we need to think about the moon. And with respect to the moon, the moon's gravity is only 16% of that, that of Earth. So when we see a 0.37 for Earth, that translates to, for the moon, 2.25. So here's the first clue as to the setup for your potential landers. Uh, you need, probably you need the engines, I keep getting rid of that, the engines to throttle. And it's key that for the lander portion, uh, you don't need them to throttle for the ascent portion. If you're going back up again, you don't need to worry about throttling for that engine. Uh, for the descent engine, you need to throttle it so that at the bottom end, it is less than lunar gravity, so that it can still go down. Right? Let's say you have the engine on, and you need to keep it on. There's not multiple ignitions. Uh, but at the bottom end with your engine, it's still higher than lunar gravity. There's a possibility that leaving it on means that you'll start going up again, and you won't be able to go down. So you have to make sure that throttles such that you can land. You will eventually hit the ground without shutting the engine off. And so the way this is set up is, the engines here throttle to 29%. If you take 29% of the maximum thrust weight ratio here, 2.86, you still get something less than 1. So here, the situation is because you need to land, the bottom throttle needs to be less than 1. If it's greater than 1, you'll there's a potential that if you don't time it right, you're going to start going up again. So that's the first thing. So make sure you can throttle below the lunar gravity below one here or if you're looking at the earth one you'd want that to be it to be possible to get below 0.16 it's possible to set up the lunar lander so that you don't use throttling engines and instead shut down the engines and turn them on again if you can have a whole lot of ignitions 
you can use that to your advantage, but that's generally really hard to manage. So you'll shut the engine off, turn it on again, shut it off, turn it on again in order to make sure you can approach the surface properly. But practically no real system actually tries to do that. So uh, it's possible I've done it in, in Kerbal Space Program, but it's not an advisable sort of situation. Now, as far as the minimum delta V to approach for a landing, uh, with this kind of thing where you're, you've got a direct descent and you're just hitting the surface without getting into orbit first, you still need to reduce the velocity that you're coming in at. So normally to get into orbit around the moon, you budget about 800 meters per second. And then to land, depending on when you do it, you can, it could be as much as 2,600. For the lunar module for landing on the moon with crew, they budgeted about 2,600 meters per second for that. Now this obviously has less than that because if you take the 800 plus 2,600 you get 3,400. This uh, is relying heavily on the fact that it's going to slow down right at the last minute. And the minimum, the absolute minimum that you need if you don't want to give time for let's say avoiding boulders or anything like that, the absolute minimum is you need to kill the 800 no matter what. And then the orbital velocity around the moon is 1,600. So the absolute minimum is 2,400. So this is getting by with just a little bit more than that. And it worked half of the time. So the severe probes, there were six of them, and three of them failed. So I'll leave you to judge whether this is uh, advisable setup or not. Uh, but yeah, uh, here, again, the idea is that you're going to reduce the velocity as late as possible with the SRB, dump that off, and then use these little thrusters to do the final bit of descent safely, and then it'll land on the surface like that. This is the Luna 9 probe from the Soviet Union. This was the first to make a soft landing on the moon, but even though its setup is similar to that of the surveyor system, it has some features that you probably won't want to duplicate. And the basic idea is the same. You have a really big engine here. It's not an SRB. It's not a solid fuel booster. It is a liquid one, but it provides a huge amount of thrust, about comparable to what the SRB on the Surveyor Probe did. And, but in this case, instead of having uh, it separate off and having separate landing engines, landing engines are integrated. They're these vernier thrusters here. And the main engine will shut down and the vernier thrusters will do uh, a last little bit. However, they're using the same fuel. You can see the two fuel tanks here. They're using the same fuel as the main engine. And so actually, I think this is the tank and there's a tank here. I forget exactly which round bit is the tanks, uh, but that, that could be an instrument section up there. But yes, yeah, so the main, the big engine will shut down at the last bit and then the little verniers are going to ignite in order to try and make for a soft landing. However, they do not throttle. So that is, uh, Problem. I actually don't know why they don't throttle. Uh, they, I think there are variants of this engine that do, but anyway, so they don't throttle. So to solve that problem, because it's bound to be a little bit rough on touchdown, uh, they decided that the capsule, the capsule would pop off of this. You notice there was no landing legs on this portion. The capsule will pop off. It has this shroud over it, and it's just this egg. And the egg has airbags. The air is built in, so it inflates it with air that's built in. The airbags inflate. Uh, it hits the ground somewhat hard, and then they deflate. The airbags protected it. It's an egg, so it's sort of protected like that. And only when it's uh, finished, it will naturally roll into a position where the panels can open and the sensitive stuff can be exposed at that point. So that was the idea behind this probe. Uh, so that, that will be a little bit more complicated to set up if you're doing your own sort of system. Uh, it's nifty, but yeah, but having throttling engines and just nice big landing legs is probably the better idea. But generally space probes are not made like this anymore. It is 1960s stuff where they didn't have the guidance to have things approach the moon the way human landers do. And so they just aim directly and uh, made sure that the burn happened at the last minute. Literally because both systems have the main burn done within a minute. Okay, so that's how space probes do it. 
in this case, this system had a lot more Delta V, 3,400. Uh, again, I would say that that's the normal budget. Uh, if you don't want to have severe frustrations, uh, 800 for the, killing the orbital velocity, uh, and then uh, 2,600 to do the landing from orbit, except this does that all at once. This is the Soviet proposed lunar lander mission, and it's a bit more complicated because, of course, crew has to return to orbit after landing. Uh, this is a crewed mission, so and one crew actually only, uh, but... Yes, actually returning to orbit afterwards complicates matters, but also the system that was meant to capture the mission into orbit also had to carry a return capsule. So that's why it has 4,189, because it has to not only carry this mass, but also the return capsule. So about 1,600 meters per second is used out of that in order to capture into lunar orbit, and it did actually make orbit uh, first. And then this block D, that's what this stage is called. After it dumps about that much fuel, uh, let's see if we can, oh, that's the wrong fuel. Um, I said about 1,600 or so. Uh, somewhere in that vicinity you'll have left after it does the capture into lunar orbit. Then you see it has the 2,600 or so in order to do the landing. Yeah, some generous amount, just with the lander. The return capsule, then the return ship, the Soyuz, is left in orbit. And then it has this fuel left in order to slow down. But again, you see where the landing legs are. So you know this portion doesn't actually set down at the last minute again. Of course, it's still, it has a burn time of about five minutes. So it's much more gentle as far as things go because this is crew. And we have the Earth... Uh, thrust weight ratio here if we take a look at the moon thrust weight ratio it's still relatively fast compared to the moon's gravity so this cannot possibly touch down because a it doesn't throttle and b its uh, thrust weight ratio is too high uh, for that part so it goes off uh no i did not want to take that one these are the engines on the lander so here we have the engines on the lander and this part does the final bit of the landing. It actually has backup engines as well. It's, it's got a lot of little engines there. But this engine, it doesn't show all the delta V here because what happens is somewhat complicated. Let's see, there we go. Uh, what happens is there's fuel for landing in this landing leg portion. See this portion here? This portion is, has the fuel for landing. But when they go back into orbit, they discard this, and then they just use this portion to make orbit. So it's a little bit complicated for how that works. Basically, the landing portion has about 400 meters per second to slow down and stop, and it's functionally similar to the surveyor engines or those little verniers on Luna. So it just does that part where it does the soft landing portion, and of course this engine does throttle. As we see here, 27% minimum throttle, and um, when it's throttling, it's basically full of fuel still because uh, most of the fuel in here is for getting back into orbit. So it's basically at that 2.38, so it can get below the thrust weight ratio one that we need to make sure that it actually sits down on the ground. You see here it says 156 for the landing leg portion, I think. And I don't know why this still says 2,845, this says 2,645, they don't agree. The normal budget to get into orbit is 2,200. That'll be more than enough because the orbital velocity around the moon, the minimum that you need is 1,600. You'll need more than that. But 2,200 is already generous. Uh, what this has is an amount that also allows them to take samples and stuff like that. So there'll be extra stuff in the cabin, potentially. So that's not accounted for in this. But uh, yeah, allowing for carrying some samples back and all that business, uh, this has extra delta V right now. Uh, it also needs to rendezvous with the, the return pod. So it relied mostly on this stage providing a lot of the impulse to land, doing most of the landing burn with this, and not only the last bit with this, and then mostly the, this portion is for getting back into orbit. And so we have the lunar module here. This did not have to worry about getting into orbit. The Apollo service module did that portion. So this started its work once it had reached orbit around the moon. 
So that 800 meters per second is not relevant to this lander. And this is often how landers work these days, even if they're probe landers, except they won't have the ascent portion. Uh, they have a lander engine, and maybe modern uh, probe ones will have vernier engines, but in this case, the Apollo lunar lander just has a single engine to rely upon. If that engine would fail, they would just return to orbit again using the other engine, and the probability that both engines fail is fairly low. So if this engine fails, they would just use this engine up here to get back into orbit, and they'll just cancel the landing. Uh, so this engine, of course, throttles, and it has uh, extremely generous throttle, 11% minimum throttle. So it can easily deal with the fact that it has a 4.74 thrust weight ratio with respect to the moon. Remember, with respect to Earth, it's still less than one. You don't need to build it so that it has a thrust weight ratio of one on Earth. But here it has a maximum thrust weight ratio of 4.74, and if it can throttle to 11%, that it can easily get to below one there, and so continue to ascend safely. Uh, the minimum requirement is 2,600. This has 2,851 meters per second, and that allows for stowing the rover, for instance. So right now we don't have the rover mass on board, but if you wanted the rover, you can put that on too, and that won't cut too much into the delta V, and if you need some other um, supplies, you can put those in as well. So remember, the absolute, absolute minimum that you could possibly need to land on the moon is 1,600 meters per second or so, perhaps uh, more like 1,700. But that would only be relevant if you could do all that at the last possible second. The longer it takes you to land on the moon, the more delta V you need to budget to overcome gravity losses. Basically along the way, because you start on your descent path and you're no longer going along with gravity, now you're partly fighting against it in order to give yourself enough time to do the landing. As long as you need to fight against gravity a little bit to give yourself enough time to do the landing, you need extra delta V for that. And so the 2600 is to allow for the extremely long burn time that we have here with the lunar module, the 10 minute burn time. This is probably at the higher end of the possibilities. If you, I mean, all the other examples that we've seen take less time and that would be more efficient. The benefit to having a long burn time is that you have a smaller engine because that means that you know, you're not providing as much thrust. So this is a smaller engine uh, relative to the size of the whole vehicle. In fact, the thrust of this engine is less than the thrust of the Luna 9 engine, the big engine that was on the bottom of Luna 9. Um, well, it's comparable. It's about in the same department, but I think it's a little bit less. But the Luna 9 uh, descent module was less than a tenth of the mass of this. So that gives you the sort of it's, it's quite a stark difference. So you can have the same engine, but then as long as you can manage to do everything in, you know, 10 minutes, then you can make a landing. And the structure of the whole vehicle can be lighter because it doesn't need to deal with the vibrations and the forces of a stronger amount of thrust, right? Relative to the size of the vehicle. So in this case, the thrust weight ratio relative to Earth is less than one. The asset module doesn't need the full 2,600 uh, 2, to get back, but that again helps with having samples, a substantial amount of samples, and for rendezvous, and a little bit of buffer, just in case. So also, you have to keep in mind that the RCS system, the reaction control system, the little thrusters, uh, use the same fuel. And they use some of that for landing as well. The RCS thrusters are only on the ascent stage here. There's no RCS thruster or small thruster on the descent stage. So some of this delta V can be used uh, while they are descending. And that has to be kept in mind. The ascent stage does not throttle and it has a substantial amount of thrust weight ratio. That's so that it doesn't experience as much gravity loss. So, yep, the eight minutes still, it's still a long burn time. So. Yeah, it'll probably need a 2,200. Getting back into orbit, the minimum you would need is like 1,800. And uh, that's if you have a decent amount of burn time instead of eight minutes. <laughs> uh, you know, two, three minutes, you could probably do with 1,800. So you can think of those kinds of budgets. So 
Getting into orbit around the moon is 800, uh, unless you're doing it at a really bad time. 800 is probably the minimum to get into low lunar orbit. But after that, everything depends on how quickly you can do your burns. And quick burns are great for probes, but uh, if you've got a large vehicle, you probably want it to be gentle anyway, so you don't have to make it very heavy. So that's what we see here. Given that, we are going to simulate the Apollo 11 landing, and I'll show you how that goes. Well, I say Apollo 11 landing, but frankly speaking, we're probably not at the right time for it. If we take a look at the situation, um, this side is facing Earth. So, Earth is there. We would want to land somewhere on the side facing Earth that's in daylight, so it's over here. That is definitely not the Sea of Tranquility. So, we will not be landing in exactly where they landed. Uh, we are currently on the opposite side from the landing location. And I'm going to, I've already got the crew into the lunar lander. Uh, you'll note that this has used some fuel for uh, capture on the moon, but actually um, I fudged that, so I, I cheated it into orbit for the purposes of this demonstration. Uh, normally I'd expect it to be uh, less than half full at this point. Uh, probably about 40% would be enough. If we take a look at when we decouple here, uh, here it has 2,300, which is way too much. Um, we would expect it to have more than 800. That's all you need to get back home is 800. So it could have one-third the amount of fuel and still have enough to get back. This is obviously too much. It only needs to get back with this portion now. But yes, it can, uh, all the other fuel, about two-thirds of the fuel in the service module is used to uh, capture around the moon with the lunar module initially. Okay, so here we have uh, 2,600. We need to make sure our RCS is available. And the lunar module descent engine is active. I locked the fuel, so we need to unlock the fuel. And yes, RCS on. And okay. And what we can do is set up an initial descent orbit. That can be done all the way from the opposite side of the moon. But I'll often start my descent about 90 degrees away from the landing location. And our initial orbit here, it's worth noting, is about, I'd, I'd say 60 kilometers is a good start. So averaging around 60 kilometers is fine, but we're not exactly like that. The lunar module descent engine had three ignitions. And I, my plan is to use two of those. Actually, this initialization of descent can be done with just the RCS if necessary, but uh, let's do with this. And what we want is a periapsis that's about 5 kilometers. And it should be overshooting the landing location. That's one reason why I like to do it at 90 degrees instead of on the opposite side. Um, so here we see, I want to land over here, but our orbit terminates over here. So that's overshooting. As we slow down, that will come in. So we'll get this landing guidance as a reference. I'm not going to use it, but we'll use it as a reference. Right now, it doesn't think that we're actually hitting the ground. So it doesn't know what's going on. But let's say I'm going to uh, enter, well, um... So Oceanus Press Alarm, I think that's where Apollo 12 landed. But uh, let me pick target on the map. We should be under our orbit. Obviously, you should be at the right inclination to land at the location. Uh, that would be good. So if you want to land up there or down here, this is not the right orbit to be in. Okay. So then we proceed. Keeping in mind that we have a 10 minute burn time. And we need to make sure that we don't hit any surface features. The moon has some tall features, and also the the zero altitude isn't... I've never been at a zero altitude on the moon. It's always pretty high up. So you want to be above 20 kilometers if you really intend to clear everything. Here, as we approach the landing, most of the terrain is fairly low because it is in this mare. Uh, Oceanus, actually. Oceanus press alarm. Uh, so 
Everything is fairly low around here. So as we approach the landing site, we don't expect much high terrain. So that's beneficial. But if we were in more of the bumpier territory out here, uh, we'd have to watch out a little bit more about how we approach that. So keeping in mind the 10 minutes, we can sort of click in uh, for Kerbal Space Program purposes, we can just click on it there, or we could estimate based on our orbit exactly when we're going to need to start the burn. We need to, at the very least, be able to do, because uh, we're going to be slowing down. Um, we need to do about, I'd say, six minutes ahead of where we're landing. Now, our total orbital period is one hour and 50 minutes. So that's 110 minutes altogether. 60 minutes for the hour and 50 minutes for the rest of it. So it's about 110 minutes, 111 minutes. And we need to uh, start out at least six minutes ahead. We can throttle down, so we could do it even earlier than that. But let's say six minutes. So I do six divided by 110. That's about uh, z uh, 0 0.054 and multiply by 360 to get degrees. So that's about 20 degrees ahead of time. So if you if you don't have any other reference except for where you're at, you can get the latitude, sorry, longitude of your planned landing location. We see 55 degrees, uh, that, that's pretty close to 56 degrees west. And so we need to be 20 degrees ahead of that. So if we have coordinates, we can go with 20 degrees ahead of that, which will be 36 degrees west. Uh, if we have a view like this, orbital view, you can put a protractor to it and calculate the 20 degrees, however you like to do it. It all depends on your burn time, though, So you and how much you can throttle, too. But let's go with that theory. So when I get to 36 degrees, I'm going to start. And you see our altitude with respect to the terrain is lower now because we've been descending the whole time. We're only at 30 kilometers. We started about average 60-ish. And if you're using a system that can do it, uh, surface negative relative velocity, uh, basically the landing was automated for Apollo, but they could have taken manual control if they needed to. There would still be a computer trying to manage the balance of things like the RCS, though. So it's not purely automated, uh, purely manual. Okay, we need to sell the fuel down ahead of time. You can see the engine is in red here. Okay, now it's okay. Ignition. So you can see the target difference is going to go down, and that little marker where we're going to impact is going to come in. And this is where we're going to have to fight against gravity a little bit in order to give ourselves enough time. And we do that by pitching up a little bit. We can also uh, throttle down if necessary. And it did so for part of the burn. If you don't have references like that, uh, it doesn't significantly matter. What you want to do is make sure that the vertical speed is going to be moderated. For this part until you slow down you need enough time to slow down so just make sure it's not going up or down too much i'd say the absolute minimum on the vertical speed is about 100 negative 100 meters per second would be a place to stop you might fall short of your target like that though see we're falling short now so but it's better than not landing at all Another way we could have avoided a pitch up is if we started the burn a little bit later, but we would still have to make sure that we get through it. We have to make sure that we can decelerate the whole 1,600. So we've thrown down here to sort of keep it going closer there without so We clearly started the burn a little bit too early. You'll note the number I have here, Suicide Burn Countdown, that will not always be available, and it's not always perfect, but you certainly don't like to see zero there. The goal is that's when you would have to throttle up all the way to survive, basically. If that hits zero, you must go to full throttle in order to make sure that you don't smack into the surface. If it's going up, you're giving yourself more time. 
but that might be less efficient. Remember, it's efficient to do the burn at the last minute at full throttle to avoid smacking into the surface. That's efficient, but it might not always be desirable, especially if you're trying to avoid obstacles. One of the downsides to the automated probes is that they didn't really have the leeway to avoid obstacles very much. Whereas the lander like this with its generous delta V and its slow engine uh, can sort of avoid boulders and stuff like that to facilitate a better landing. So our target difference is going away, so I'm going to pitch down. And there are other ways to figure out whether you're going too long or too short. You'd have to do a lot of calculations based on your stage time, uh, your speed, and your coordinates, basically. The difference between the target coordinate and your coordinate, you could get, you could triangulate that. And then you can get your surface velocity and also estimate how much time. Uh, now, I made a script could do this, but uh, doing it on the fly as a human being is a little bit more difficult. But that's a matter of whether you want to hit a particular spot or not. And so some system like uh, being able to see this target difference might be helpful if you want to hit a particular spot. If you just want to land somewhere on the moon, that's not as much of a problem. Here our suicide burn count that is going up, and I can just tell that we've got a lot of velocity. Note that the vertical speed has been kept very moderate, uh, definitely not more than... Uh, I guess not less than negative 100, or not more than a magnitude of 100 meters per second. I'm going to be content with uh, being about this far off right now. Now you'll see that even with all of the tilting up and fighting against gravity, we've still got plenty of delta V here as we wrap up this landing. So even if you do have to pitch up a little bit, it's not going to hurt that much. I'm just going to land here. I could have done better, but uh, this will be fine. So again, throttling down allows you to continue descent while the engine continues to be on. Uh, at some point, especially below 2 kilometers, we do not have the automated system continue to control it. If you're in Kerbal Space Program. And I throttle up. Here, and we try to kill the horizontal velocity. This is critical. You see the horizontal speed there? If you don't want to tip over, you want that to be minimal. And so what we want is the little X marker, the retrograde marker, to be straight up and down. So on the nav ball, move your craft to be on the opposite side of it from the top point there, the pinnacle point. Uh, see, it's going off to the side there, so I move off to the side here. Uh, uh, but don't do too much. Don't do too much. Oh, no. Ah, I ran out of ignitions because I draw down too much there. Okay. Well, we barely made it safely. That was not the best demonstration ever. Uh, you can do it much more elegantly than that. Oh, I always tip my, my craft over. So I have, a, I have a bad tendency to have landers tip over. We got lucky there. The, the legs really, really survived the heavy impact there. But uh, yeah, I did that burn a little bit too late, I would say. I think a good sort of number to go with is if you take the altitude, divide by, I'd say 10, divide by 10 and make sure your descent velocity is not more than that, that'd be good. So at 300 meters, it should definitely not be more than 30 meters per second. At 100 meters, not more than 10 meters per second. That, that's still pushing it a little bit. I mean, it definitely should not be more than that if you want to play it safe. But we had plenty of Delta V in here to land much softer than I did just now. Uh, and we could have Neil Armstrong did it and hovered for about a minute before trying to uh, actually make the landing. So I was a bit hasty there. But you get the general picture, hopefully. Uh, the key is to manage your vertical speed because you're basically coming in with one of these landers, uh, either this one or the crewed Soviet mission. Uh, you're skimming the surface, right? You're very close to the surface already. And you're sort of skimming the surface. 
And so your vertical speed, you don't want it to be up or down too much. You should be pretty close to zero. You should still be going down. Uh, but if you need some more time, you can have the vertical speed going up. But if you're going down more than 100 meters per second, you're probably going down too fast. Uh, and then at the last bit, uh, kill your horizontal speed so you're not going laterally and then you just come straight down at the location. And that would be good. So maybe in order to avoid the sort of issue that I just had, uh, you would want to kill the horizontal velocity earlier. And again, that just means getting your retrograde marker, the one with the X on it, uh, right at the top there. And if you've got it close enough to the top, you can manage the location of it with just the RCS. Instead of tilting the craft uh, left or right or whatever, uh, you can actually just do RCS puffs. In Kerbal Space Program, that's with the I, J, K, and L keys. And you can just use those puffs to try and get it closer to the top instead of tilting the whole craft one way or another. Okay, uh, just as a wrap up, we're going to take it up back to orbit. And we will want our target ship, the command and service module, to be somewhat behind us. This will be fine. Okay, so having that as our target, you can see the distance to target there I've got configured. We don't need the lagging guidance anymore. So, uh, RCS on and launch. And off goes the ascent module. And we see a heading to target. Uh, that is wrong. It's behind us. So we want to go 270 in this case. So going in a retrograde direction. We see the relative inclination fixing itself. The moon doesn't have an atmosphere. So as long as we're sure that we can clear all obstructions like hills, you know, don't smack into a hill, uh, you can more or less go horizontal very quickly. This engine doesn't throttle, but it doesn't need to. Make sure, though, that you maintain enough time to apoapsis to complete the burn. This has a seven minute stage. You're not going to need all seven minutes in this case, but that time to apoapsis had better not go down much lower than this. So you'll maintain some pitch to make sure of that. And another consideration is making sure that we get the relative inclination as low as possible so that the rendezvous is easier. Yet another consideration is we do want to get the apoapsis up to the same level as our target, about 63 kilometers in this case. If using MechJeb, we can use the Surface Plus thing and then again maintain some pitch above that. That will point it in line with the prograde vector and then you can add an extra pitch here. If you want to go side to side to manage the inclination, you can use the yaw here. Uh, since we're at 0.15, I just want it directly in line with our current path because 0.15 is good enough for me. And so we'll just leave it like that and manage the pitch so that we don't have a drop in the time to apoapsis until we're very close to our peak. So if we are within a minute of the end of our burn, we can let that go down to zero. We can get the vertical speed close to zero and that'll be fine. Okay, we're getting close to the end of the burn here. This is where we can sort of let the time to apoapsis go. But we're very low on this end. I should have waited a little bit longer than we could have maybe made a direct rendezvous, but it's not necessary. Okay, and that's good enough. Apoapsis is a little bit high, but anyway, we'll clear all obstacles, I think, with that periapsis, and we can eventually manage to meet up with it. So the same principles for rendezvous apply. We're a little bit higher on this side. It's behind us. I would like to boost up our orbit so we're just tangent on the opposite side. Actually, our apoapsis was back there. This isn't the best time, but anyway, prograde. The main engine only had one ignition for the ascent module. Actually, it had multiple ignitions, but I think this one... Oh, actually, they gave it more ignitions, but I won't use it. They wouldn't have used an ignition for this particular one. They'll just use RCS. 
It's just too powerful for doing rendezvous burns like this. So I'm just using the RCS to boost the periapsis. And we'll see the closest approach distance go down. I don't want to boost it up too much. It's fine for me if we take two orbits to rendezvous. So I'll basically split the difference. Here it's uh, 16 kilometers. And it changes a lot just by turning. But I'll just boost it up a little bit more. Just pressing H to increase, and then we get to about 3 kilometers. Just depending on who's catching up with whom, higher orbit is slower. So we're getting into this little bit higher orbit to make things easier. The delta V requirement is not very much. I will, as described before, push the retrograde marker over to the negative target marker. That's the little dot with the three lines coming out of it. So I'm on this side of the retrograde marker, pushing H, pushing forward to push it along towards that. And we will see that the closest approach distance decreases thanks to that. Again, don't do this until you're lower than 10 kilometers away. Everything above 10 kilometers is just, are you faster or slower than it? Are you in a higher orbit? Are you ahead of it or behind it? Just adjust your orbit accordingly. Okay, 200 meters is fine. Let's get over there. Oop, oop, oop. Now we can get rid of the relative velocity completely. Now for an Apollo mission like this, the two objects are not static. In other words, it's not a station like the International Space Station. So it's possible just to get the two objects to point at each other. The nice thing about having the two point at each other is that, you know, the velocity vector should be going directly at it. You don't have to worry about aligning your axes. So this is a much easier docking situation than otherwise. And we can see it sort of tilted away from us. So we should fix that. So this points directly at it with a velocity vector directly at it. This other side. You make sure it's pointing directly at the opposite vehicle. And since we're fairly close, it should remain reasonably stable for that. So yeah, this is the easy way when you have control over both vehicles and one of them isn't a station. And there's docking. All right. So next time we're going to be talking about how re-entry into Earth's atmosphere works and we'll see how that goes in the next video. So with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you next time.